I would say the whole world and every individual would change dramatically if from youngest age you're taught by your parents and by your schools and by society that you are absolutely needed, you have a purpose, you're indispensable. Death is just the end of one stage. It would be the equivalent of saying, I take a piece of wood, I put it into a fireplace, and then the wood dies. Yes, the wood will no longer be wood, but it's turned into energy, it's turned into fire, it's turned into warmth, into light that continues to live on and just in a different form. Today, I get to sit down with Rabbi Simon Jacobson, the author of Toward a Meaningful Life, a book that takes his teachings and wisdom that he has studied from over 4,000 years of literature, faith, wisdom, philosophy, and put into this incredible book. This book for me has been one of my favorite reads of 2023. So I'm so excited to dive into this interview with Rabbi Simon Jacobson. We talk on so many different topics from anxiety to finding purpose to escaping this matrix that we live in. This one was an incredible interview and we have so many more videos and podcast episodes with Rabbi Simon Jacobson. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure you hit the notification bell and the subscription button. I wanna say a massive thank you to everybody who supported us at mulliganbrothers.com. There is a sale on right now to help you get ready for 2024 where you can get the Memento Mori posters behind me. They're interactive posters that remind you every single week that you are going to die one day and that time is very precious. Memento Mori, remember that you are mortal. For me, that has been one of the best things I wake up to every morning. I tick off one of those boxes every single week and it represents how much time I've had. There is a box on there that I will not cross off. And for me, that has been extremely powerful in reminding me to live with passion and purpose. The frame and the poster are available in the link in the description where there is a discount and also the Not A Journal the success journal that has proven to change your guys' lives. And I want to say thank you to everybody who's given us feedback on the journal. If you're just stocking up for 2024 or you're buying your first journal, there's also a discount with the link in the description. But before that, guys, let's dive into this amazing conversation with Rabbi Simon Jacobson. For people who don't know, just introduce yourself and what you do. So my name is Simon Jacobson. I was born and bred in the United States, in New York. Born in 1956 to uh, both my parents are Russian born and they came to the United States after World War II. And I grew up in a uh, Jewish, uh, we call Hasidic, very intense community, with an intense Jewish education with focus on the mystical and the spiritual. But I had a unique blend between uh, growing up with many rituals and traditions I go back thousands of years, but also a very open-minded home. My father was a journalist, so there was really no dogma in our home. We weren't uh, imposed upon. Nobody forced us to do anything. I ideas flo flowed easily. I, I could uh, naturally be skeptical and ask questions. I wasn't silenced, which really worked well for me because by nature I'm not uh, a conformist. I'm a skeptic, and uh, and that was really good. I was I read voraciously and my life was shaped so much firstly by my parents that um, very nurturing and loving parents my father was a very unique individual he passed away 18 years ago that's why i speak about him in the past my mother is alive and kicking and uh, <laughs> she's a very spirited person and then i was shaped also by my great mentor known some by some as the rebbe lovingly as the teacher, as the mentor. His name was Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. So my teenage years, I was very drawn to his ideas, his philosophies, which was a very global vision for life, non-parochial. So I'm like this odd mix. On one hand, I definitely live a traditional Jewish life, but the ideas are really universal and they transcend cultures, races, religions. Some people call me the rabbi of atheists because I know how to think like an atheist. And <laughs> you know, I don't take anything for granted. Everything needs to be discussed. And there's no such thing as absolute proof. You make choices in life, which is what I discovered. There's no, uh, you're not gonna find an absolute proof for anything for that matter. You just have to try to be honest because we're all subjective and many of our choices are emotional. 
And uh, the, so my teenage years, I would say I was a rebel without a cause. And then I found my cause, <laughs> which was in a way to use my skills, my communication skills, my writing, my teaching, my also ability, I think I understand the human condition well, to use it to help people find their mission and their calling. You know, there's so much clutter in people's lives that um, it's hard to cut through the, and get to the core of like, why am I here? So many of us are are busy chasing our tail or trying to uh, serve other people's expectations and demands, whether it's parent pressure or parental pressure or social pressure. So I see myself, my mission to help people find their own voice and sing their song. And, um, and that's what I do. I wrote a book called Toward a Meaningful Life, which is, uh, thank God, was very successful. It was published by William Morrow. And uh, now it's been translated into 14 languages. It's sold millions of copies. And it really does exactly that. It helps people find meaning, deeper meaning in every aspect of their lives. In other words, not to live a superficial life, but a life of deeper purpose and meaning. And then as an outgrowth of that, in the, that was published in 1995. An outgrowth of that emerged the Meaningful Life Center, which is what I had today with a very great team of people. And what we do is we produce content programming um, using all the platforms out there, whether it's internet, whether it's social media, whether it's YouTube, you name it, and uh, in all types of different uh, formats, whether it's video, audio, text, and to all types of audiences. And uh, you know everything is relative. I'd like to reach 8 billion people, but slowly we're getting there. <laughs> and that's what I do. And I uh, very gratifying work. So practically speaking, my day is usually occupied either with doing programming, online programming, video, classes, workshops, or speaking engagements. I travel around and speak, or coaching, personal coaching and counseling. And I'm also training people, like to train trainers, so I can replicate the methodology that I learned and I've uh, absorbed, and try to teach a new generation of leaders that method of how to live a most meaningful life. One of the things that I did want to talk about and, and get your thoughts on was purpose. It's a massive thing that our audience connect with. It's something that we feel we've found in our work and um, I can see that you feel that you found in your work. But let's start with like, how would you define purpose? I think the best example is always to find something tangible. Like everybody, you don't need to be, go to business school to know in business 101, you must have a mission statement. If you go to investors or you go to customers, everyone wants to know what is your mission? For example, Google. Google's mission uh, loosely is to organize all the information of the world and make it readily accessible. A mission that drives their billion, multi-billion dollar industry, and uh, what do they have, 100, 200,000 employees. So a mission statement is essentially the purpose of that organization. Without that, you don't have a focal point. People have different agendas. Even, you, even if one person is running the company, you know, what do I do today? What do I do tomorrow? The mission is like the hub that connects all the dots, that connects all the spokes, and directs it toward a goal. And that goal has to be not personal profit or personal gain, some good cause, something that serves others. In this case, the internet provides all kinds of information. How do you organize that information? So I always ask people, if a business can't function without a mission statement, how can you function without your personal mission? And most of us don't have one. Most people, you tell them, what's your personal mission statement? They either look at you, oh, that's a good question. I never thought of it. Or they say to be happy, to make a lot of money, to bring up a healthy family. Those are beautiful goals, but they're not considered mission. A mission has to be unique to you. Every company is supposed to make money. Every company is supposed to have happy employees. So unique to you would mean understanding yourself, your talents, your skills, your unique opportunities, your unique personality, and how are you going to in some way improve the human condition. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, I wrote a course called Discovering Your Personal Mission. I created a formula. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. It's POP plus P plus H equals M. I'll spell it out. POP is P-O-P-P. -P. Your personality, your opportunities, the people you know, the places you've been to, plus P, your passion, plus H, some higher calling or higher cause, equals M, your mission. 
and many people have used it. That really creates focus. You see, we grow up in homes and environments and schooling that teaches us how to be efficient at best, to be efficient technicians, learn a skill, medicine, law, uh, technology, uh, finance, or whatever it may be, or creativity, and figure out how to make money so you can pay your bills and succeed. But no one ever began, one second, what's the mission? What's the purpose of it all? You could spend all your life doing great things and ask yourself, why am I doing it all? So really, mission and purpose is like the why of life. Why? Why am I here? How do I want to make a mark in this world? How will I change my corner of the earth, make it different than when I came in? How does my life make a difference? And to be honest, many people, when you ask them, do you think you really matter? You know, most people first, they giggle. Of course I matter. I have a healthy ego and I have uh, plaques and I have uh, awards and I accomplished this, I accomplished that. But I'll rephrase it into a more, uh, I guess, metaphysical or cosmic question of asking, if you were never born, would it make a difference to anyone? Remember, if you weren't born, no one's expecting you. So it's not like there's a tragedy if you don't show up. Once we're here, what we call circumstantial purpose, we find reason to be. And many people are doing great things, noble things, kind things, bringing up beautiful families, being uh, generous, virtuous, But that idea that I absolutely am necessary, that I have an absolute mission, is one I think in our world is a big question that young people and older people have. Because think of it this way, we have 8 billion people on this planet. 8 billion people. So what's our relevance? It's like another grain of sand on the beach. How significant is that? So I would say the whole world and every individual would change dramatically if from youngest age you're taught by your parents and by your schools and by society, that you are absolutely needed. You have a purpose, you're indispensable. And what you need to contribute to life, you and only you can contribute. That's the essence of purpose. And you wake up in the morning, you don't feel I'm a number, or I'm a statistic. I am actually have something to bring to the world. I love the way you articulated that. Like, would it make a difference? I, I think that's a really nice way of putting it. Um, I mean, it's quite a, a stark reminder that, you know, we have an opportunity in this, in this world to have an impact as well. Um, how, how, would you, how would you coach somebody who felt insignificant at this moment in time, who, who felt that they weren't having an impact? Uh, what would you say to them? How would you talk them through that? My first thing would be, I'd go back to the formula I mentioned of passion. I would look for some, something that ignites their passion. Like, what are you excited about? Some people say, I love music. And then you explore. Okay, so how can the music that you love help you become a little more confident, help you make a contribution? It's not, you never want to force someone to do something that's not natural to them. We all have a mission. We're just not aware of it. So you find some people are not creativity. Some people are very cerebral, very analytical. You try to identify uh, traits or talents or skills or passions, and then say, okay, so every day, just like you exercise or you eat and have a healthy diet, every day do something that expresses the thing you're passionate about and try to do it in a way that shares shares it with someone else. Doing a, a kind act, a random act of kindness every day. The key thing is to remember it's not just mission, it's also to be proactive. When you don't have a mission, then you become reactive. Like, I don't know what drives me today. Oh, a phone call comes in. This one wants something. Okay, now I know what I need to do. Instead of waiting to react, when you know what you're good at or what you want to do, then you're going to initiate. You'll be proactive. You will generate. Instead, we won't be just takers. You'll be a giver. And that's the real goal with anybody. You want to get them from a place of just waiting around for something to happen to make things happen. My father, as I mentioned, was a journalist. He, he told me many times, and I love this expression, he says there are three types of people. People who make things happen, people who watch things happen, and people who ask what happened. You want to be a person who makes things happen. So my way of coaching or counseling anyone is the first thing is try to get them. And baby steps. You don't have to run a marathon of 22 miles. Start with a few steps, but that you initiate it. Simple example, you have email, you have text, you have social media. Every day commit to sharing a kind, inspiring thought with someone else. 
It doesn't take much. It's pressing a button. You don't even have to create the content. Share something that came your way. And you can't imagine what happens when a person begins to be proactive. Okay? Proactivity breeds proactivity because then it also empowers you. You feel, oh, you know what? I can initiate. One of the things that you're talking about there is inspiring people to, to make that change or to have that awareness, to find purpose. And then, you know, before this conversation, I spoke about what happened to myself. Uh, it was the loss of my son that kind of triggered that for me. And, you know, it, it put, put me into a position where I wanted to, I had this like amazing awareness that I wanted to do something that had meaning behind it to help others. Is there, um, I mean, what, what's your thoughts on the idea of something bad having to happen to somebody to, ha to create that awareness? Is that, is that the thing that happens? Can people find it themselves without that? Uh, well, excellent question. Um, look, I'm gonna talk about a comfort zone. We all like comfort zones because it makes us comfortable, obviously. But comfort zones sound like innocuous, but the truth is they're very dangerous actually for the human condition. Because when you're too comfortable, you're not motivated. So the strange thing is that as much as we don't like to say it, it's when your system is shaken up and disrupted is usually when we wake up to deeper realities. You know, if everything's comfortable, I'll sit around on my couch, couch potato, and really do nothing. I don't have to do anything. Unfortunately, and this is the big mystery that no one has really figured out. Maybe this is part of God's mysterious plan that there's nothing that wakes a person up like than pain. You know, when you're comfortable, you're not necessarily, you, you know, I'm, you'll eat and sleep and do your thing. So tragedy, as Leonard Cohen puts it, is that uh, there's no such thing as a perfect life. There's no such thing as a perfect offering. Life is filled with cracks. Cracks are tragedies, are setbacks, are challenges. But it's through the cracks that the light gets in. Because if there's no crack, in the egg, the chick will never get out. So the truth is we have to look at pain and suffering not as something we invite and welcome. We prefer not to have it. But if it does come our way, you have to see it as uh, the ability for a new birthing, for like a paradigm shift. And all paradigm shifts happen through some disruption. We hope the disruption is minimal. You know, I'm sorry to hear about your son, but you know yourself what came out of it. And we hoped it could have come without that. Can it happen? Uh, yeah, there are people who have perhaps are blessed with grace and moments of epiphanies and awakenings where something, but often it happens through some disruption. It can be a loss, it can be a death, it could be uh, an unexpected getting fired from a job, having to move, a divorce, a betrayal. Uh, as I said, we hope it should be in the minimal, but it's usually the shakeups that cause you to go deeper. I, I'll quote Warren Buffett, he says that you don't know who's been swimming naked until the tide is out. You know, when the, when the water is high, everybody can be swimming. You don't know who's who. It's when the lights dim and life becomes a little more challenging, that's when you see the cracks. And that's where really, we're really tested. I mean, I don't like to use cliches, but I'll quote another. I think it's Eleanor Roosevelt that said, I think she said about women, but I think you could say about all of us, that we're like tea bags. You don't know how strong you are until you put into hot water. And then suddenly this little tea bag releases that powerful taste. So I think that's life. Challenges and uh, getting out of your comfort zone is the key to growth. Now, I would advise people, don't wait for a tragedy. Don't wait for a loss. Bring it upon yourself if you can. But you need a motivation. You need a motivation. I can say personally for myself, I've been blessed I mean, I lost my father, he passed away. We don't say, my mother used to always say, I, we didn't, I didn't lose my husband, I know exactly where he is. You know, with it. But my point being is that, but I really have been blessed, I didn't suffer any, thank God, serious tragedies of loss of a young child or, or loss of anything of that nature or any such tragedy, and may be the rest of my life that way. But I've seen a lot of pain, I've seen around me, family and others, and I deal with it a lot because people come to speak with me. And, I, and uh, so I always, always say, listen, get out of your comfort zone before you're forced to get out of it because that's the key to growth. And it's always that way. It's competition, it's angst, a certain restlessness that gets you going. So in your situation, I'm sure that you're a different person. You'll never be the same. 
but it's the cracks that allow the light in. New, the, the greatest things in life have come through the, the, the pains and agonies and tragedies that we've experienced. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. And yeah, for, for me, it did completely change me. Um, I think a book that I did actually find a lot of help in as well was Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl. Um, and I, I'd love the, the watchers of the show to go read that book. It's not a long read. And um, there's a, a striking, the bit that really st stuck with me at one point was there was, um, his friend was having a, a, a nightmare like and he was in i don't know if you remember this part but he was shaking in his in his sleep and it was you know he's having this absolutely terrible nightmare and he was going to wake him but he thought if i wake him he wakes up to a much more a much worse situation than the nightmare he's going through right now and that for me explained well, or had an impact on me massively about what these these men were going through at the time um and then the experience of resilience and very stoic philosophy that Viktor Frankl had in that moment. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the book, but also maybe some of the, the takeaways from it. I mean, what, what was the book about? Well, like the title indicates Man's Search of Meaning. Man in Search of Meaning. And actually, I wrote a book called Toward a Meaning for Life, so I have a special affinity to that. It's the idea that I'll just use my own example. You know, you're a ship at sea. And if you're lost at sea, you have no way to figure out how to navigate. Um, and then a storm strikes and you're lost altogether. And you could even capsize, you can, you can drown. Meaning and purpose is the navigation of our lives. It, uh, it's, it transcends our joys and our pains. And that's why a person of meaning, who has meaning in life, is not necessarily going to suffer less, but the suffer will be more bearable. The suffering will be more bearable because they know there's deeper purpose and something will come of it. And he talks about the Holocaust, even though he developed these ideas before the Holocaust, but it was all confirmed because he said, I saw people suffering in the worst possible way. And the same suffering, everyone, and yet there were some that had more resilience. It was those that had deeper philosophy that there's a deeper purpose to life. And they didn't develop that necessarily during their suffering. They had it beforehand. They just in some way had an additional resource to navigate because that deeper meaning allowed them to hold on to that even when everything seemed lost, an element of hope, of optimism. But if you have no destination, if you have no direction, then when the storm comes, what's the difference between a good swimmer and a bad swimmer? You see it during a storm. A bad swimmer is going to fight the tide and won't know how to navigate and will ultimately get exhausted and simply lose strength. A good swimmer won't fight the tide, won't fight the tide, will just flow with the flow, go with the flow, swim along until they get till the storm ends. So it just gives you an additional perspective that allows you to not find the answers to the big question of why, but the way I would like to put it is, that the question is not why bad things happen to good people. The question is, what are you going to do about it? And that's the people of meaning ask that question. They don't focus on the why, because they know they'll never find the full answer. But the question is, what am I going to do about it? I'm not going to allow myself to get paralyzed and allow a second death to happen, not just the loss of my, whatever loss I have, but also losing myself. And they make sure to insist to continue to thrive. This is actually a powerful verse in the Bible, which is about the exodus from Egypt when the Jewish people suffered greatly in maybe the first documented institutionalized slavery and genocide, the story of Egypt. Egyptian slavery, talked about thousands of years ago, it's a great, a great verse, a very powerful verse. As they were afflicted and they suffered, in direct proportion to that, they thrived and they flourished. So it was their affliction that actually brought out the best in them. Now, again, we don't want affliction and we're not trying to justify it. As I said, there's no answer to the why, but there's an answer to what am I going to do about it? And Victor Franklin, in his brilliant way, developed logotherapy, which is based on the book Man, Man in Search of Meaning, which helped so many millions of people in, uh, in discovering that deeper purpose. I don't think anyone who suffered a tragedy that has gotten through it in some way will tell you 
that I needed to find deeper meaning in my life. It's the only way I was able to manage. If not, the, the trauma, the, the tragedy is just too overwhelming. You know, how do you manage? So there has to be some bigger picture that you so-called submit to, surrender to, and that allows you to, that allows you to carry on. It's such a hard thing to articulate. Like, I, I, I struggle to tell people that, you know, the worst thing that ever happened to me also led to some of the best things. It, it led to the most growth, for sure. Is, is there a way of articulating that? Because there's a lot of people right now who, who may feel that they can't overcome this, this thing or they've buried it. Is, is there value in, in trying to go through the process, get to the other side? You have to listen. The only way, where they say the only way out is through. You can't avoid it. Once something has happened that is a, a tragic event, a loss, a death, uh, or anything that is a setback, some people numb themselves. You know, you just uh, self-medicate, and you numb yourself, you distract yourself. But that doesn't mean the pain's not there. It just means you're not feeling it. It's like someone that kills their nerves. So it's not going to last. So the fact is, there's really no way out. It's like, I'll cry, like but one great uh, scholar or teacher told a student who had a tragedy, he said, I don't have answers for you, but I can cry with you. Tears are very uh, cathartic. They're very healing. There's nothing wrong to feeling... You know, feeling that, feeling that I'm not okay. It's it's fine. Some people just need to know that they think you know if I'm weak or vulnerable or I'm hurt or I'm crying, something's wrong with me. No, there's nothing wrong with you. That's exactly what is natural. That when a person suffers, cry, and you don't need answers. And find people that will hold your hand. And if if you're a person who's supporting someone who's gone through that, hold their hand, be there for them. You don't need to give answers. You don't need philosophies. You don't need explanations. I always say this. The greatest mind cannot speak to a bleeding heart. So it's not you're going to find some type of brilliant uh, concept or brilliant philosophy that's going to explain away a tragedy. Tragedy is just too strong, too powerful for the mind to fathom, let's be honest. The mind cannot deal with it. So you have to go deeper than the mind. And the place that's deeper than the mind is love, faith, hope, meaning, and purpose. And that's what you hold on to for your dear life. And you just forge ahead. And some days are going to be harder and some will be easier. But I'm not going to mince words. I'm not going to say it's all, we all know it's not, uh, it's not a uh, party. Sometimes it's very painful. But don't, but remember, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And if you can move from one day to the next, you get stronger, whether you know it or not. And ultimately what will emerge is a new person. A person that you'll see that you went through the fire and you become a more powerful person in the process. I also say always speak to others who've been there so you're not alone. Loneliness is a very big problem here because when you suffer, you think that nobody can understand me, nobody wants to be around a person who's in pain, you know, they'll never get me. Having others that have been there and the empathy that they can bring to the table is a tremendous healing agent. Absolutely. Never underestimate that. Again, we see, we go back, uh, what pain does, it throws you out of your regular comfort zone. So all the tools that you had yesterday are not working. And that makes you feel desperate. You know, everything I was using, I, had, I thought I was in control of my life. And if I wasn't in control, I was able to do this. And I was able to buy this. And I was able to go to this one, you know. And then suddenly you're left completely helpless and completely vulnerable, naked, you know, all those resources didn't work. And that is very demoralizing. So the answer is find deeper resources. And they're there. Now you need to dig deeper. There's really no option. And that's really, I mean, that's what it comes down to. And allow others to allow others in that want to help and could help. And reach out to others. Don't isolate yourself. Because isolation and loneliness just exacerbates and makes the problem worse. Because then you dwell, you like marinate in your own pain and just reinforces again how bad things are. You need to be around people who have been through it, who have an optimism, hope. And I'm not talking about naive, just uh, people who understand life, have seen the pains of life, but also seen the strengths that come from it. If you're enjoying this episode with Rabbi Simon Jacobson, please go check out the sale at mulliganbrothers.com where all the profits go back into creating this content and 
funding our mission to inspire change around the world. Get ready for 2024 with the Memento Mori posters behind me and the frames with the link in the description. There is now a sale on and also the success journal, the not a journal, how journaling should be done. It's about affirming your goals every single day and breaking them down into small steps. This makes them possible. This is one of my favorite tools. So thank you to everybody who supported us. Let's dive back into the conversation. Something you mentioned then was about, it's okay to cry, it's okay to, to be in touch with that, reaching out to other people. And I think an issue that we see in, I would say the, uh, the newer generation is an unwillingness, among men, young men, unwillingness to open up and share and, um, you know, cry, especially. And it, I would say with our audience, some of the guys who watch our video, especially associate with being an alpha male. And, and to be an alpha male means to not show weakness. And, right. I'd love to know your, your thoughts on that. Well, listen, our society also feeds that stereotype. The toughness, you know, to me, the most tough, the toughest people are the people who know how to be vulnerable. Vulnerability is not a bad thing. It's honesty and it's truth. And it's actually the people that are most impressive are the ones that can be vulnerable. But vulnerability in our society has gotten this bad name of, you put it, weakness. You know, like, like if you're silent, it means you're weak. Oh, sometimes the smartest people know how to be silent. They know when to shut up. They know when to close, you know, not to speak. It's a, it's a tragedy in many ways because our society cultivates that type of, you know, you've got to be a go-getter. As a matter of fact, you mentioned men. Many women are trying to copy men and do the same thing. But that approach to life, a more intimate, more gentle approach, that crying and emotions are very much part of who we are, is far healthier and far more real. And it's time to tell all the alphas that uh, part of being a real tough guy is also knowing how to be a person who can uh, be sensitive. And it's just not a dog eats dog world of survival of the fittest. Feeling for another and feeling for yourself is very, very human. As a matter of fact, it's the strongest tool we have. Because let me ask you this, if everybody's gonna go with an alpha approach, what is that gonna do for relationships and love? Mm. Isn't love also an element of vulnerability, of surrendering there's another person it's not just about me but it goes back also to this uh, egocentric society we live in you know i always tell people if you see someone that's too arrogant they're probably very insecure so they just hide it they mask it with their aggressive with their aggression and so on but they're really just afraid a little child that's afraid and they so i think a lot of the alphas you see are not alphas at all they're just scared children that are putting on a uh, you know, like you have those animals that make themselves bigger than they are to frighten others, but they're not really that way. Or the porcupine, the sharpest needles of the porcupine to protect the underbelly, which is the most sensitive underbelly of all animals. So sometimes the outer aggression and the outer strength is just masking inner vulnerability. And uh, it's time to change that attitude. And it's really about finding yourself. So there are times we need to be strong, but there are times that perfectly fine to surrender and know there's another person in your life and you're giving and you're and I don't say submitting but you're also deferring your yield you don't have to always win you don't have to, you know but we live in a world again it's a very egocentric world where it's about me me survival of the fittest whoever's more powerful if I don't take care of myself no one else will and that really cultivates a approach of, of being far more selfish and narcissistic you know, like the guy that goes on a date and he speaks uh, about himself for two hours and then he turns to the woman and says, okay, enough about me. Now, what do you think about me? So like two levels of narcissism, you know, first he talks about himself. Now he thinks in his benevolence, he's allowing her to talk about himself, about him, not about her. So this is the society. It's a very driven very much about me, me. And I think it comes from a deep insecurity because again, going back to purpose, if you don't know who you are, you're going to start creating all kinds of fabricated strengths. And in the turn, it creates this illusion that, uh, that being vulnerable or crying is weakness. Not weakness at all. It's great strength. Imagine a kettle that's boiling and there's no spout. It'll explode or implode. Tears and expression of emotions like the spout. You have a lot of emotions in you. It's good to express them. It's good to cry out. It's a sign of a healthy expression. If not, what do you think happens? It ties you up in knots. We know that the body keeps the score, as they say. 
traumas of our lives that are not expressed, ultimately they don't go away, they just go inward. And then you become this very tight individual filled with these complex emotions and neurosis because you've never allowed yourself to speak. I've met people who told me they haven't cried since they're five years old because they were told only babies cry. What happened to all those emotions? They imploded and the person is, is generally usually quite dysfunctional to be very frank. I remember a guy came to see me and he was telling me how he's been bullied in his life and he's always the victim and he's always being hurt. It was really tragic. It just made me cry just to look at him. So I asked him, I said to him, tell me, have you ever cried about your life? He says, I haven't cried since I'm four year, five years old. My father told me, never cry. Only babies cry. And that, like, you know, froze him. So I don't know. I didn't even know what I should say to him. I asked him to stand up. He was sitting in my office. And I stood up and I went over to him and I hugged him. He froze. I couldn't tell you. I, I felt, felt like a a solid piece of concrete, like, and I saw how tight he was. Like his whole body just froze up. Like, I guess nobody had hugged him ever. And I just said, he said to me, why are you hugging me? I said, I just wanted to show some, some compassion, some feeling for you. But he couldn't even deal with it. And, and then, then he said to me this line, he said, if I start crying, I don't think I'll ever stop. I have so much in me. So it's exactly the kettle so is that, that's called alpha male? That's not exactly alpha person who's, uh, unfortunately, he, my goal with the, one of the, was one thing, give him the permission, the license, you can cry. You have a license to say I'm in pain. You have a license to say that I was hurt. That's always the beginning of any healing. Break the silence, allow yourself to breathe. Don't hold it in. It's like trying to hold in the, the breath. No, you have to exhale. And that's part of healing. It's like every infection that festers, you need to open it up to fresh air. The idea of re releasing pressure is, uh, could, could not agree with it more. Like, and if you, if you keep it within, it was, if you suppress it, I feel like it comes out in weirder, wonderful ways. Yeah. And, it, and if, you, if you keep it in knowingly, I think you, you do explode. You snap at people, you're angry. You, it, it comes out in, in horrible ways. And for, I used crying. Mass. I, mean, I still cry like every so often, it, you know, the grief will, will catch me and I, I, I will cry. Uh, but I've learned not to hold it back for sure. Like, and it, cathartic, great word for it. It really is cathartic to cry yeah. and uh, allow that pressure to be, to be released and come out. Yeah, God forbid, you know, somebody dies in a family, it should never happen. Mm. But the idea of sitting in the Jewish tradition, there's Shiva. Seven days you sit, you don't go to work. People come visit you. It's very, very healing. Don't try to be so tough and I'm getting back to work. You know, no, there's nothing wrong with taking off a week in honor of a father or mother or a relative that has passed away. Besides respecting them, just for your own emotions, allow yourself to, it's like a wound. A wound needs to heal. Don't force yourself, you know, if you force yourself, the wound will not go away. The body does keep score, it does. I, I was in a meeting, uh, it was a, ba a baby loss meeting and um, it was three, two or three weeks after Jacob had died and uh, I hadn't cried. I, I physically couldn't, I don't know what it was. I couldn't feel any emotion, I couldn't cry. And I went to um, this meeting and people were sharing their emotions and stuff. And after that, it just released something in me. I was able to cry and it, it all started to come out and I started to feel better eventually. But um, there was a gentleman there who, he said, I felt the same way as you. He said, I didn't cry for two years. I, I could, just couldn't do it and uh, one day, my, my father came to the door and when I opened the door, he looked at me. He'd not spoken to me about the baby. He, he'd come to speak to me about the baby. And um, I fell to the floor and he said, and I, I cried for two weeks. Like I couldn't stop crying. And it was that that point of, it doesn't go away. Suppressing it does not make it go away at all. No, of course not. Um, the, How yeah, old was Jacob? He was a baby. So he, he was, a, he was a, st a stillborn baby. So, um, you know, we were expecting, it was our firstborn son, we were expecting him. And then when he was delivered, he, he wasn't breathing. So it was, uh, yeah, it was very difficult. And I think I cried, I cried a little bit when it happened. And then it was, I, I felt no emotion for two or three weeks. And I really wanted to, like, I, I remember this frustration with not being able to feel anything. I felt really guilty about the fact that I couldn't grieve him. Um, and I knew my process because I'd lost my grandparent one time and um, my, my grandmother, she'd passed away. And 
the that process for me was very much seeing her, you know, having those moments with her after she passed, her funeral. Like I, I really grieved over her. So those two weeks where I couldn't feel anything with Jacob were like torture to me. So I, I, I knew that I had to cry. I knew that it, it had to come out at some point. Um, and it did, it took a long, long time period to go through that and get to the other side. But um, yeah, it, it again, it's difficult to talk about sort of the idea of there being a silver lining for that. I remember thinking how cruel it was that this had to happen for this good thing to happen as well. Um, I still can't explain that to people, but I, I do think that that is the case with a lot of the people we meet. They've been through some kind of tragedy that's left to led to growth and them being able to help other people as well. I don't know if you see that yourself. Of course, um, there's an expression in the Talmud that says when you pray for someone else in need, your need will be responded to first. You know, in, sci in science and in psychology, uh, in neuroscience, there's a concept of mirror neurons. Mirror neurons, that we mirror each other's neurons. I mean, the classic example is that you see, for example, someone's about to close the door on their finger and they don't even realize it. You'll even cringe. You'll say like, ouch. How, why? You're not feeling it, but you identify so much with the other, you're like mirroring their experience, which is really the power of empathy that we're really, on some fundamental level, really one, even though we feel like we're two people. But that's more on an external level, especially if you're familiar with quantum mechanics and science physics. It talks a lot about the intrinsic unity of all atoms. That everything in this world is like interconnected. It's like one large organism. It's only due to our own blindness that we don't realize that we're part of one reality. So the idea that uh, one part of the body is strong and strengthens other parts of the body is not so surprising. And that's why when we reach out to each other, someone in a situation, someone else can help you in more ways than one, not just because they're, empath they're, they're empathetic and they're sensitive, but because they're part of you. And when they allow that to come out, that love, that actually is a healing force. It's just like we see people who have been in injury. So then the part of healing is to strengthen other parts of your body. Because as you get stronger, it'll also strengthen that part that has been injured. So the human race is that way. And it's a message that most of us are not even aware of. You know, we see ourselves as separate entities. And yes, it's uh, noble to be benevolent and kind and compassionate. But it's much deeper than that. We're real, all parts of one larger organism. If one part hurts, every other part is hurting, whether you know it or not. And that's why it's so tragic when you see war or genocide or any form of injustice. It's like hurting, imagine a human being going the right hand, killing the left hand, or hurting the left hand, it's, right? It's absurd, but that's the story. So in mystical teaching, it teaches that there's an intrinsic unity that connects us all. But then there's this, this uh, cosmic concealment that doesn't allow us to see it. So we think we're separate entities when in truth we're really one. I think a lot of it as well comes down to that, the idea of ego again. Like we, because we have consciousness and we have these egos that, yeah, we don't feel, we don't feel connected. We feel very selfish or that we need to look after ourselves. Um, e ego's a topic that does really well on our, on our channel. Cause I think a lot of people wrestle with the idea of ego especially the idea of striving for success, entrepreneurship, trying to, you know, uh, find place in, in the world, uh, especially like the business world. What is the, I mean, what's, what's your take on, you know, having ambition and, and balancing that with ego as well? Let's start with this. Every human being needs to have a healthy sense of self. Um, so ego is a very positive thing. It gets out of control like anything in life when it's the only force in your life. It's all about me. So that, the goal here is not annihilation of yourself or your individuality or of your identity. It's knowing how to harness it and balance it. So I'll introduce you to a new word. It's a word in Hebrew. I'll, I'll just say the Hebrew and then I'll explain. But it's a, tr a tremendous word. It's, I'll spell it B-I-T-T-U-L. It's called bitl. What it means is, it's hard to even translate, but I'll try to do my best. A combination of modesty, humility, but even more than that, suspending yourself 
in face of something greater than yourself. So how does that work together with ego? Having a self is a very important thing, as I said. Self-preservation, self-respect, self-esteem. Someone that feels like a doormat, that feels worthless, is not, not healthy. So you need to have value, but you have to recognize that all your strengths are not self-made. You're not a self-made person. You have parents. Whether you believe in God or not, but you have life came from somewhere. God gave you life. Moses, the Bible tells us, was the humblest man on earth. But Moses was also the greatest man. Chosen by God, he's like the greatest leader. So how do you balance those two? He was quite aware of his, of his uh, qualities, but he always said to himself, they're not my own. I was given to me as a gift. And if someone else received this gift, they may have done better than I. So you see a combination of ego and, and, and individuality, but also humility. The mistake that people think is ego and humility are antithetical. They're not. Egos, a healthy ego means I'm a sense of self, but not because I made myself. I was given value. I have a line in my book, Toward a Meaningful Life. Birth is God saying you matter. You matter not because you think you matter, not because you have a healthy ego, because you were put here with a purpose in this world. So it's recognizing that yourself, the identity that you are, is not just because you made it on your own and you were successful because of ambition and other reasons, but you were blessed. So you get credit, but it's not all about you. There's a great statement from one of the sages, Hillel. He said, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? So on one hand, we need to understand the value of our, our own contributions. But we also understand that we're also part of something bigger. And that your very self, the self that you are, is not independent of that bigger reality. That's the balance. And I would go a step further that a person whose ego and self is driven by something greater, the ego is a far stronger one. Because sometimes you have to fight for yourself. Whereas a person who's just an egomaniac will sometimes retreat when they shouldn't be retreating because of their own fears or insecurities. So I would say the most secure thing in life is to know that you are not made, you were put here. And that gives you a certain divine purpose. The first thing the Bible says, the human being was created in the divine image. Nothing in this world is divine, but you were created. It means you're a piece of the divine. I don't know if there's a more powerful ego statement than that, but that makes you more responsible, not makes you more arrogant. So I think that's the balance that is missing very often in our society. Going back to the point of feeling that if I don't take care of myself, no one else will. You know, when you see selfishness, it makes you also selfish. You know, you need to be, you have to match others because they're not going to protect you. So therefore you have to protect yourself. I always love this joke about these two guys that go camping and in the middle of the night, one of them hears a bear rustling about. A bear is you know, looking for food. So he wakes up his friend and says, we gotta get out of here, there's a bear. And as he's doing so, he's tying the shoelaces of his sneakers. And his friend says, what do you think? You can outrun the bear? He says, no, all I have to do is outrun you. You know, this is the classic me, me, me. But we have to also know there's a deeper side to us, which is, as I mentioned before, the connection that we all have. So I don't see it as a contradiction. I'll just give an example. Look at the human body, a healthy human body. Look at nature. It's made of, of individual parts. The heart and the brain are very different. The lungs and the liver are very different. Every organ, every faculty, every cell in the human body is different. But they all work together in this unbelievable harmony. So it's not about everybody being a clone. Individuality actually contributes to the harmony. You know, think of a symphony. You have an orchestra of many different instruments, many different musicians. They're different, but they're all working together. So frankly, ego, healthy ego, and healthy individuality complements the synergy of the whole and vice versa. Everybody else complements each other. That's the challenge. What we often do is go to extremes. Either it's complete fierce individuality at the expense of others, or I completely give up and I completely annihilate my own self for others. Both are not healthy. You need to, your heart needs to be a heart 
for the brain to be a brain. And the brain needs to be a brain for the heart to be a heart. And then, and then they work together. You know, I don't know how many films in the world do, don't work out, but the ones that do work out and they get produced, look how many credits there are. I'm always amazed how so many people with egos got together and able to pull it off. Then you hear all the nightmares behind the scenes and how many films do fall apart because they can't. But at the end of the day, hundreds, thousands of credits, and I'm sure there were conflicts. And yet they, they figure it out. You know, maybe incentives, whatever. My point is, we have the ability to have healthy egos and also find the balance to not become arrogant. The film industry is a really good, that's like a good way of putting it. Even there, which is driven completely by ego. Yeah. Massively, yeah, that's why I think that, yeah. Um, the, the idea of the, um, that we were placed on this earth and uh, we were, you know, we were brought into this world, we were part of the divine. I'd love you to speak on the science of existence. You know, this is something that's captured our audience's imagination as well. And it, it almost speaks to the idea that there is something higher, there is something bigger out there because the science behind it also doesn't really make much sense as well. It's still very mind blowing behind it. And my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, I speak about, there's a chapter on God and on unity as well. And I go through like a series of steps uh, with the question being, what is reality? A oh, very, very simple question. <laughs> what is reality? So the first answer that most people give is the reality that I experience. You know, we're sitting in a room, I see you, you see me. Basically, our sensory tools, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. I see things, I hear things, I taste them, I touch them, or I smell them. That's our empirical reality. So then the question is, okay, is there anything more to reality than that? And everyone will say, of course there is. There's a whole bunch of things you don't see, you don't smell, and you don't taste, touch, or hear. Our example, love. You don't see love. You can see an expression of love, but love itself, an idea. Two plus two equals four. The day is different than night. These are concepts. You don't see them, but the mind perceives them. Or emotions, the heart feels them. So there's many things that we don't experience in that. So then you, re okay, so then reality we see now has expanded from the sensory, we'll call it to the suprasensory. Now, how far down the rabbit hole can we go? So we go, let's do the next step. Conscious experiences. What about the subconscious? What about the unconscious? What about the supraconscious? And I'll just use examples from science since we're talking science. You see objects. We all see fire, water, tables, chairs, birds, trees, whatever it may be. We all know these are made up of elements. Elements are made up of molecules. Molecules are made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of subatomic particles. And then the sub-sub, and as I said, you go further down this rabbit hole, no one knows how far it goes. So we, you see now the world, that same question, what is reality, depends what your perspective is. If you want to look superficially, it's the tip of the iceberg. But we all know there's a big iceberg beneath that tip. We all know there's energy. Today we know energy and matter are interchangeable, as Einstein put it, E equals MC squared. You take a piece of wood, and you put it in a fireplace, it turns into energy, to heat, to fire, to warmth, to light. So today, especially, we've become comfortable with the invisible. Just take your smartphone. How much information is in this small phone? It's hard to even imagine. How could all that information fit into a little phone like that? In the 50s, you needed to have three blocks of computers to, to contain so much information. So we've become accustomed to the fact that there's a reality that we don't see that really governs our lives. I mean, every time I turn on a television, every time I see a screen with imagery that's being broadcast from who knows where, a tennis match in Australia, and you see it here, it's simultaneously you say, how did that image get here? Split second. You see, you realize there are many forces at work. My point that I'm making here that the word reality is exactly like climbing a mountain. If you ask somebody, what does the horizon look like? If they're standing in a valley, they'll give you one answer. If they're standing on a plateau, they'll give you a second answer. If you're 20 feet up on a mountain, a third answer. And if you're on top of Mount Everest, a fourth answer. And they're all telling you the truth. Only this distinction is from my perspective. That's my answer. My answer is from this perspective. That's my horizon. So being an honest, intelligent person, whatever I said doesn't require faith. Everybody understands it today, that the world is not what it appears. 
What you see is not what you get. What you see is the outer surface. We mentioned before tears, crying. When you see tears coming out of someone's eyes, the physical manifestation is, yes, a little salty, it's, it's, it's wet, but we all know that the tears are an expression of emotion. Emotions you can't see. Tears you can't see. But no one's going to say, first I cry, then I feel emotion. No. So first the emotion and then the tears are an expression. The same thing as smile on your face. Right? The face goes into a certain contortion as an expression of joy or happiness or satisfaction. My point is that today, it, if you want to be an intelligent person, you have to realize that what you see is an outer surface of many more forces that are at work beneath the surface. I can give many more analogies. This is a topic that is critical. And when people hear it for the first time, they say, of course, it's a given. So then my question would be on a personal level, so what defines you as a person? Is it your outer self, your body, and your body language, or is it your what we call our soul, the soul? Something that's not quite visible, but more important than anything else, because your body at the end of the day is a vehicle for a personality, for an individual that has feelings and ideas and experiences and pains and joys, which is, of course, the whole, what we call the bundle called life. The thing that we can end on with, with this conversation, I think would be a really nice roundup, which is almost, well, it is inevitable for everybody, and that's the, is death. And uh, the, I don't know what your, your thoughts on it are, but I think um, an acceptance of death and understanding that it is inevitable, it is coming, can be quite helpful for a lot of people, but it's a very difficult thing to do, especially again, when we bring in the ego and a lot of the things that we're taught, we don't really get taught about death very much at all. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, death is maybe the ultimate um, grief and the ultimate tragedy because it has that finality to it. You don't just say the word death and people right away shudder. Death sounds like the end. Someone died, they're gone, story is over. And um, I don't know how these pieces interact with each other, but I'll just refer to something I spoke about. But when you understand that reality is a bigger picture than just what you see, then you really come to realize death is not the end. Death is just the end of one stage. It would be the equivalent of saying, I take a piece of wood, I put it into a fireplace, and then the wood dies. Yes, the wood will no longer be wood, but it's turned into energy. It's turned into fire. It's turned into warmth, into light that continues to live on and just in a different form. You take water and the liquid and you uh, boil it, it turns into gas. You freeze it, it turns into ice. So you see there are many forms of the same reality. I used to always be frustrated, frustrated, very difficult when people say, where did the soul of my mother, my father, my child go upon death? You know, you don't really have words. But then, I don't know, one day I had an epiphany and uh, it's somewhat a little funny and humorous analogy, but it works. And I said, imagine, a dialogue, a conversation between a refrigerator and electricity. And the refrigerator says to the electricity, where do you go when they pull the plug? And the electricity responds like with incredul incredulousness and says, what kind of nerve, what kind of chutzpah do you have to ask me that question? You're a little box they just invented 100, 200 years ago. You figured out how to generate and contain me, the electricity, to refrigerate food, and now you think you're the center of the universe. You ask me where I go? I've always been here. I've been here long before you ever existed, and I'll be here long after you die because I don't occupy the space of your little box. That your little box can only see what you can see. I go back to my place, which is outside of time and space as you know it. Everyone who hears that, even people, they say, of course. I said, that's what we need to discover, that the soul lives in a very different type of domain. We're just not soul people, we're body people. So we judge everything by, it's, I don't see it, it's not here. But that's not true. In this room right now, even if all the people left this room, it's not an inanimate room. It's, it's pulsating and brimming with all kinds of energy. We know that today. There's no such thing as something that's dead. The word dead is not even an accurate word. Now, I'm not taking away from the tragedy of that stage ending because I want to be able to embrace my loved one. Yes, I understand their soul lives on, and it's consoling to hear. But I want them on my terms. I want to be able to hold them. I want to be able to talk to that person. I want to be able to kiss that person. So I'm not dismissing the tragedy is that it's not in our domain. That it's, 
But no one ever should say, and no one should ever think that a soul dies. Souls never die because they weren't born. They were here before, and they just occupy a vehicle called the body for a certain period of time, and they continue their journey. And it's very consoling. And the fact is that, yes, the soul of your son, Jacob, whatever time that he, as he developed in, 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 in the womb of his mother, lives on somewhere, hopefully through you as well. And the same is with every soul. So again, I've, I've experienced the death of my father, so I am aware of the pain. It didn't like, even though I'm fully aware of the soul, I still cried. Because there's still that element that it's not on my physical plane. You know, that it's on a spiritual plane. And we're not spirits. We are spirits within bodies. But, um, but the more you connect spiritually, the more you'll connect to the soul of your, the loved one. And in that sense, that never ends. Soul never dies. And the more soulful you can be on this earth, the more you connected and the, the less uh, the finality of it is there. You know, you realize there's much more to the picture. Thank you to Rabbi Simon Jacobson for doing this. If you've enjoyed the conversation, hit the notification bell and the subscription button because there's so many more conversations I had with Rabbi Simon Jacobson that have still yet to be uploaded. You can find all his details to his Instagram pages and YouTube pages down below. But one thing I would recommend, if you haven't read it already, Towards a Meaningful Life is a fantastic book. I'm reading it for the second time and uh, the, the, the depth of history and philosophy and um, spirituality and you know uh, faith in there is incredible. Like it really is incredible. There's so much detail in the book. Uh, I recommend you go read it. It's fantastic. Even if you're not into faith, like me, I'm. I wouldn't put myself down as religious, but I love this book and uh, I think it's fantastic. If you want to help support us, you can head over to mulliganbrothers.com where all the profits and proceeds from the website go back into creating this content and trying to push this movement of Inspire Change. We now have a sale on for Get Ready for 2024. You can get the Momentum Warrior posters and frames with the link down below. And it's a poster that reminds you you're gonna die. It's a very humbling poster that I wake up to every single day. It represents your life and shows your life. It's interactive. It's a great gift for friends and family as well. So if you wanna remind them that they are going to die and that their time is precious, go down below, hit the link in the description. And also the Not A Journal, the success journal that actually gets you to make stuff happen is also on discount finally. So link in the description, get ready for 2024. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider becoming a channel member as well with the join button. All of the support from you guys has been incredible, honestly. Anyone who's just hit notification bell, dropped a comment, shared the videos, it's incredible. We are not stopping here. The mission is getting bolder and brighter and more clear to us every single day. And uh, at the moment, I'm trying to do as many interviews as possible and it was made possible with your help. Thank you so much. Have a blessed and productive day and keep your eyes out for more. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.